Okay, and sons? Okay. Okay. Also ich muss dem Christian Stenecker denken, der ein äh, dankender ein Fellow ist bei uns und der das ganze Technische für uns macht, also der einen Link eingereicht, äh, geleitet hat und so weiter. Jedenfalls äh, sind wir froh, dass wir diesen 30. Band zusammengebracht haben, der im vergangenen Herbst rausgekommen ist. Äh, der Mark ist auch schon fest an der Arbeit am Band 31 und wir äh, zur Zweiten Republik und da haben wir beinahe alle Aufsätze schon herinnen. Aber er ist Mitherausgeber, also Herausgeber zusammen mit der Eva Pfanzelter in Innsbruck. Okay, jedenfalls ist es doch für uns, für, vor allem für mich erstaunlich, dass es uns gelungen ist, so lange dieses quasi Jahrbuch herauszubringen, weil die Finanzierung gibt natürlich immer besondere Herausforderungen auf. Und ich überlege mir gerade, ob wir vielleicht doch auf Englisch reden sollten, weil da Leute dabei sind, die nicht Deutsch können. Also ich stelle jetzt auf Englisch um, okay? It's always a challenge for us uh, to find financing for these volumes. And over the years, uh, we had support from the uh, Austrian Foreign Ministry, but they have pretty much uh, reduced their contribution. So right now it is the funding of Center Austria and of Innsbruck University Press, which mainly help us uh, get this yearbook uh, finance. I mean, if you look at uh, international Austrian studies or English publications in this direction, there's not really that many journals uh, that you could submit an article to. So in that sense, we find it's an important publication also for uh, young Austrian researchers that they have opportunity, opportunities next to the Austrian History Yearbook, the Journal of Austrian Studies, and now Botsdieper's online Journal of Austrian American Studies in uh, contemporary Austrian studies to publish their work. So that's an important focus of uh, uh, our endeavors that we give an opportunity to Austrian researchers uh, uh, to, to find a publication venue. Now, over the years, I had many co-editors and I'd like to thank them for the first 15 years. It was uh, Anton Pelinka in Innsbruck and then it was his colleagues in the Department of Political Science because that was where it was situated for many years, uh, Fritz Plasse and then Ferdinand Kallhofer and lately, uh, I have sort of looked for uh, co-editors according to the subject matter, just like this time around we have Hans Pitcher from the Austrian National Library and uh, Martin Kofler from the Tyrolese Photo Archives as guest editors because they are foremost Austrian visual historians. So depending on the subject matter, we always look for people that are appropriate, but since we have a partnership with the University of Innsbruck, that is still uh, one of our uh, principal partners. But of course, we are open to other uh, ideas too, if anybody has suggestions for future volumes. So, okay, that's uh, contemporary Austrian studies. The way we usually put these volumes together is that uh, we select the subject matter find guest editors and then coordinate with them in terms of who do they suggest we could publish. Uh, we also have a feature called non-topical essays. If we get essays submitted that don't have to do with the main subject matter, we have uh, forums or round tables. For example, in the next volume, we have an interesting round table of uh, it's sort of interesting that in Holocaust history, some of the first and early practitioners were Austrian historians. Uh, uh, so we have uh, essays in this forum on Simon Wiesenthal, on Johnny Moser. Uh, uh, so uh, it's, 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 it's a panel we did at the German Studies Association, which we are now publishing. And then we have a category review essays and book reviews. And we are particularly uh, happy about that section and proud of it because we think we over the years have succeeded in taking review publishing sort of out of the very small circle of Austrianists who review one another, but we try to have Americans review Austrian books and vice versa to sort of uh, open up the field a bit uh, to new reviewers that are not necessarily liaised with their Austrian colleague 
colleagues in a direct and intimate matter uh, where they might not be willing to write a critical book review. So in other words, we pride ourselves that our reviewing culture is uh, quite open and critical and we hope to, to continue that uh, uh, business. Uh, so I think that's all, all I'm gonna say. I just wanted to quickly introduce uh, how this uh, journal is being published. And since we have two very good and competent uh, co-editors who will in fact also present PowerPoints to their presentations, I'd like to ask first Hans Pitcher uh, to present his PowerPoint. Hans uh, is an old friend uh, that uh, has been here as the Marshall Plan Chair uh, some years ago and uh, since that time has a close relationship with the University of New Orleans and of course we were very pleased uh, to contact him with regard uh, uh, to this volume that he would be uh, uh, a co-editor. He's also on a new board that we just formed of Center Austria and uh, uh, what he's going to talk about today, uh, uh, Yoichi Okamoto is a project I've tried to support him wherever I could because it relates to one of my interests, the Austrian occupation uh, after World War II. So uh, without further ado, Hans, who's got a beautiful background uh, of the <laughs> Prunksaal der Nationalbibliothek, the floor is yours. Yeah. Well, Gunther, thank you so much for this kind uh, introduction also for the invitation be to become a guest editor of this very, very special volume. I feel very honored. Hello, everybody. And I would like to uh, present to you uh, in the next 15 uh, minutes uh, three uh, contributions. Uh, contributions by Michaela Pfundner, by Severin Heinisch, uh, and by me, uh, article which are in this book. And I would like to start with uh, the earliest uh, part in history, which is the court photographer Ludwig Angerer, uh, Michaela Pfundner uh, did a lot of research on this very famous Austrian and uh, internationally not very well known Austrian photographer. Um, but actually, he was, uh, well, 20 years after the invention of photography, uh, photography be became increasingly widespread and respected in the Austrian Empire. And uh, Angara was one of the, uh, the, the pioneers. And finally, even the Austrian imperial court also recognized the potential of photography as a means of political representation and thus embarked on the, embarked on the path of modern visual communication. So the first photographs of Emperor Francis Joseph that have, have come down to us were taken as, a, as part of a group photograph of the imperial family, a shot that has been published over and over uh, and back uh, and reproduced frequently uh, to this day. Uh, actually, this is the only known photograph of the emperor together with his wife, Elizabeth, and the only known photograph of Elizabeth with her children. All the other images are fakes that, we, uh, that have come to us. Um, and as a byproduct of this family photograph, the first known individual portraits of the Austrian emperor were taken uh, also by Angara. And there is one photo showing Francis Joseph, for example, in uniform without cap and looking very seriously into the camera. Uh, it's a very famous photograph as well. Uh, now, who was this Ludwig Angerer? He was born in 1827 in, in, in Slovakia. Uh, from, the eight, from 1848 onwards, 
He worked uh, in Hungary, in Vienna, in Graz, in Budapest, and then he joined the army and he came to Bucharest, where he took the earliest photographs of, of Bucharest. And then in 1857, he left the, he, uh, the army, he finished his military service and returned to Vienna, and he became very famous and became the imperial court photographer still, and always had a very close relationship to, to, the, to the court but also he was um, a very successful pessimist man and started to sell these photographs uh, to his contemporaries. Uh, and uh, um, I think this, this research by Michael Abfundner is the, the first serious research on the biography of Ludwig Angerer. Um, the second article I'm going to present is by Severin Heinisch. Um, well, next to photographs, cartoons are another means of visual communication. And Jewish humor has found its way into modern cultures in many ways, and is often the subject of essayistic and scholarly discussion, which focuses almost exclusively on written and oral sources. Uh, but visual wit and its Jewish authors have mostly received less attention. So thanks to uh, Severin Heinisch, we know now a bit more on the role of Jewish cartoonists in Central Europe to, between 1900 and 1945. Um, and uh, I'd like to comment a bit on uh, on, on, on this uh, topic, it was not until the emancipation of the Jews in the 19th century that caricatures drawn by Jews were increasingly produced, which dealt with Jewish peculiarities in a benevolent and affectionately critical, often also biting and sharp manner. Uh, with the emergence of their own media, which were aimed decidedly at the Jewish audience, a Jewish caricature began that self-reflection on Jewish identity. Jewish caricature magazines, however, remained isolated phenom phenomena that didn't last for long. Um, there, one example uh, Severin Heinisch mentions is the magazine uh, Schlemiel, directed by a Venice-born uh, Jew, uh, Menachem Birnbaum, who was later then murdered by the Nazis in Auschwitz. And in, in another uh, author in his caricature against the assimilationists and converts, Ludwig, Ludwig Roncock, put the Jewish assimilationists it's this caricature on the right side, um, um, on the same level as the German nationalists, and quote, all assimilationists and other German nationalists are recommended the tried and tested nose shape anti semit as you can see here, said nose shape bring Jewish noses into shape accordingly as is vividly illustrated in this caricature. Ronkov dedicated the drawing to the German citizens of Jewish faith who wanted to become good Prussians. So here, the excellent example of Jewish humor. However, um, we should notice that the, the, the uh, Jewish, the anti-Semitism and uh, uh, and anti-Semitic papers in Central Europe um, can, serve, can serve as a counterexample. One of the most important um, papers is the Viennese Kikariki. It was, was originally founded in 1861 as a liberal anti-clerical pa paper, but with the rise of Luega's um, Christian Social Party from the late 1880s onwards, it became the mouthpiece of that party's clientele and shifted to spreading anti-Semitic prejudices. Very interesting article bringing a, a completely uh, or not so well received topic to a broader audience. And I'm going to present you, you now a few uh, uh, more pictures on uh, uh, 
on Yuichi Okamoto, Günther already mentioned him. He was the he was a um, um, a a famous American photographer of Japanese descent. Uh, he came to Europe uh, in the spring of 1945 as as a member of a quartermaster supply troop, but then changed to the signal corps as, and, and he then became the official photographer of, uh, of General Mark Clark in Austria and uh, depicted uh, post-war Austria. Uh, he came to Vienna with Clark in, 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 in the autumn of 1945. This is a very famous, iconic picture uh, taken by Okamoto on the Vienna, uh, on the Vienna Ferris wheel uh, during that time. Um, he, uh, Okamoto uh, depicted the post-war Austria in all its facets, not only the political history, but also the daily life um, and the allied occupation of Austria in a, in a very special and artistic manner. He was a, um, a, uh, a fantastic photographer himself. Uh, these photographs are completely unknown. These are the only photographs we know from the uh, uh, from from photographs taken um, from the movie The Third Man when it was produced in Vienna. Uh, uh, later in 1949, he became the chief of the, the United States Information Services pictorial section in Vienna from 1949 until 1953. And he was responsible for, uh, uh, for the formation of Austrian photographers and also for uh, depicting basically all the Marshall Plan projects in Austria. Um, um, I already mentioned that he was a, a, a very good artistic photographer himself with, and had close contacts to, to the Austrian artists in the 1950s um, who, whom he portrayed. Uh, he, he even made it to the famous exhibit, The Family of Man of Edward Steichen, with this photograph of Harald Kreuzberg during the re rehearsal of Jedermann in the 1950s. When, in 1953, he then came, went back to the United States and in, from 1963 to 1969, he became the presidential photographer of uh, Lyndon B. Johnson, uh, changing presidential photography forever. Uh, this is a very typical example of his, one of his photographs uh, when tens of thousands of anti-war protesters rioted in Chicago during the Democratic Convention, National Convention in 1968, Okamoto uh, portrayed President Johnson and his family uh, watching TV uh, in, from his bedroom at his ranch in Stonewall, Texas. <laughs> so there he's a, he's a witty uh, photographer. So why did we get these photographs? Uh, two persons are responsible for that. The first one, Paula, the wife of uh, Yuichi Okamoto, a Viennese uh, woman he married in, in Austria, and his son, uh, Skip or Philip Okamoto. And you can see him here as he looked like uh, in the early 1950s. And, 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 and uh, and here you can see him and his wife, Katie, as he looks like uh, today. He uh, offered his, the, the remainings of his father to the embassy in, in, in Washington, the Austrian embassy, and they contacted me and I immediately then uh, went to the United States and uh, brought this private estate of Yuichi Okamoto to, to, to the National Library. So thank you for attention, that's my part. Okay, thank you very much, Hans. Uh, we appreciate uh, your presentation and the fascinating pictures uh, by Yoichi Yui Okamoto, which you managed to get to Vienna. It just sort of tells you that uh, uh, if you have uh, imaginative people in responsible position, like Hans is the director of the Austrian National Library's photo uh, archives, uh, and Michaela Pfunder, I think, is his uh, uh, associate, and isn't she the deputy director? Uh, yes, yeah, she is. The, the, the lady that uh, did the Angara piece. 
you know, if you have the right people at the right spot, uh, you manage like this Yo Yoichi Okamoto Nachlas, the private uh, collection of his photographs, uh, was a, a considerable effort by Hans to get it to Vienna, but in the end he succeeded. So uh, I think generations of Austrian historians should be uh, uh, grateful to you for allowing them one day to do research in these papers. So anyway, mm -hmm. uh, uh, that was Hans Pitcher. And our next speaker is Martin Kofler, who is also a guest editor of this volume. Martin actually, uh, I first met when he was a student in Innsbruck uh, many years ago, when I was at the University of Munich and taught a course in Innsbruck. Uh, Martin was in that course and then later on came to the University of New Orleans. And he did his master's degree at the University of New Orleans, writing about uh, John F. Kennedy and his policies towards Austria, which later on at the University of Innsbruck became his dissertation topic. And uh, his book uh, on Kennedy and Austria is still the best piece of research we have on that very important era. Uh, so Martin subsequently went back after UNO and finished his PhD in Innsbruck and uh, then worked for a while for the Studienverlag in Innsbruck. And at that time, he sort of you could say he drew much of Austrian contemporary history writers to the Studienverlag. That's why the Studienverlag became so important in publishing Austrian contemporary history. Uh, but then later on, uh, he was tapped to become the director of the, the top the Tyrolese photo archives in Lienz, uh, where together with colleagues in the South Tyrol, he has put together quite an, a, a regional archives of photography. And he'll talk about it himself. He also put together a number of photo exhibits. And like you will see when he talks about the article by Martin Wurzer in the volume, he also managed to get nachlässe of uh, uh, individual, in this case, Tyrolese really soldiers on World War I that really have in a way revolutionized our understanding of the common soldier during World War I. So uh, Martin is sort of in the Tyrolese universe, what Hans is in the Viennese universe, a very important uh, visual historian. And we are grateful that he contributed uh, uh, to this volume. And uh, Martin, you want to talk about your essays? Of course. Thank you, Gunther, very much for your kind introduction. And hello to everybody. Also, Gunther, thank you so much uh, for uh, having me as a co-editor. Thank you. Um, I want to start um, with my um, presentation. Okay, you can see it? Yeah, yeah. we can start. All right. Uh, at first, I want to talk a little bit about my archive um, that was founded in uh, 2011. And from that onwards, now we have gathered about um, almost 700,000 um, photographs, uh, most as uh, gifts, um, also as permanent loans. Um, we um, are after um, inter-regional collections, small ones, big ones, for instance, also from the town of Lienz. And that's what we do, as you see here, uh, uh, as one uh, small um, fact is uh, how we uh, gather um, the collections. And then of course, um, we organize them, we scan them, digitize them, and then we put them into a long archiving uh, perspective. But also from uh, the start on, we wanted to present um, our collections um, uh, to the public. Um, in, as Günther said, um, together with partners in uh, uh, North Tyrol and also South Tyrol, we started a big uh, project that led us um, to make the tap, so to speak, something like a, a competence center, how to uh, handle um, historic photographs in the right and correct way. And this is where we start uh, with the first article of our essay collection uh, we're talking about today. An article I uh, wrote together with uh, Burgisilla, uh, not Burgasilla, here you have a glimpse. And um, we made the, so the basis for this article in um, the essay collection um, was our presentation at the German Studies Association in Portland, Oregon in 2019. Back then, Wugi was part of our big Interreg uh, EU-funded project. And back then, she was um, at the Office for Film and Media 
of the autonomous province of Bozen um, Bolzano in, in South Tyrol. So um, what I want to talk a little bit about um, is our article on this big, big project, a three year long project from 2017 to 2019 um, called Lichtbild um, Argento Vivo. And we had a special mission um, in that um, uh, project, uh, competent handling of old photographs, open access uh, to old photographs and uh, photography goes uh, future. Um, so uh, based on um, five um, workshops with uh, experts uh, from Central Europe, we put out in the end five guidelines in German, Italian and English, how to handle photographs in the right way, in the correct way from our perspective. And these guidelines are called Handreichungen, um, are, can be downloaded up to this day on our Lichtbild platform. So this is sort of the, the website of the results of our big um, project. Um, the five uh, guidelines, these five Handreichungen had the following topics, have the following topics. History of photography in Tyrol and South Tyrol, photographic rights and creative commons, how to preserve and organize photographs, digitizing and editing photos, and finally, photography and digital long-term archiving. So we uh, wanted and still want to uh, mediate um, these um, abilities out of the guidelines. We also created an uh, e-learning course that works up to this day. And uh, we, we uh, really wanted to create these um, guidelines also for uh, amateur chronicles, or as we call them, the non-professional enthusiasts who are interested in historic um, photographs. Um, and we also want to reach um, professional workers in museums and archives with uh, these results. So this is, so to speak, the competent handling that we want to put forward and suggest how you could, you should do it. The second part is open access to old photographs. In general, over the uh, three years, uh, we have prepared more than 12,000 photographs of the partner archives and published them on the platform I just mentioned under the Creative Commons license CC BY. So up to this day, and almost daily, we have downloads. You can uh, just um, download these historic photographs for free. You don't have to register and you can use them uh, without costs for private, scientific, and even commercial uh, purposes. Uh, the Creative Commons license CC BY says, asks for that you at least, when you use a photograph, name the a photographer as well as the a processing archives. Uh, by the way, we have also um, published the data sets of all these 12,000 um, photographs as open data. So they can also be used for programming uses and so forth um, on the platform of the autonomous uh, province of Bozen Bolzano. The third aspect, um, is photography goes future. So besides, um, I'd say, uh, general showing via um, uh, border crossing transnational exhibitions, physical exhibitions, um, so to speak, um, we have also tried to find new ways of how to promote the importance of historic photography. So we have two virtual um, exhibitions on our platform up to this day, but especially also in these three years, uh, we created an app, the Lichtbild app called Time Trip Picks, that can be downloaded for free at the Google Play and Apple Store. And we invite everybody to go on a time uh, trip and you can do this wherever you are located. Um, so uh, at first, when you see here on, on the left-hand side, you choose the language, German, Italian, or English, and then you come to, come to the next level and you uh, choose one of the four towns, Bolzen, Innsbruck, Lienz, uh, or Brunneck. And then you come to two of the main square there and you can pick two main functions. Um, there's a 36 degrees view um, of this main um, uh, square or for instance, the Maria Theresienstrasse in Innsbruck. And when you turn around yourself, let's say in your living room in New Orleans, um, then uh, historic uh, photographs uh, pop out when you look into this or that um, geographical direction. And the second um, function is that you see here on the right hand side is something I like to call a flip book or like a Daumen Kino. So there's a specific view here in the Marie Theresienstrasse in Innsbruck looking north 
towards the north kette and you have all sorts of different um, photographs in the same direction but over several uh, decades and so you can see easily like a Daumen Kino of uh, the change of the buildings and also of the street view and so forth and each one of these photographs give information and date and you can read this information or you can just listen to it via the sound file in German or in uh, Italian or in English. This was the first um, essay I wanted to talk about, um, the article by uh, Burgesilla and, and uh, myself. The second one is um, I uh, uh, try to give an overview over the mountain pictures that we have in our um, Tyrolean uh, photo archive. Um, uh, not only um, picture postcards, but also some other um, uh, main aspects. Uh, the focus that we used um, from TAP um, is based on um, a different um, concept we worked out for the Lumen, the new museum for mountain um, photography uh, south of Brunek in the Pusta Valley in South Tyrol. That's a new, a brand new uh, museum that was established in 2019. And so we worked heavily on that and looked uh, through all our collections, um, uh, filtering mountain pictures on aspects like these. So this is not only a chronological um, uh, uh, museum or a museum that looks after special photographers, but after I'd say soft topics like taking a break um, in, in the Alps, like here in around 19. A uh, 10, um, the question, a big question is mountain and marketing. Here, for instance, the, um, the sponsor Fila may have helped Reinhold Messner a lot um, climbing on top um, of the of Mount Everest in 1980. A different aspect is when the mountain as a subject, not as an object, when this mountain acts. Like here, a very bad landslide that destroyed the farmhouse in East Tyrol in the mid 1960s. Uh, a different uh, uh, topic of uh, mountain pictures is expedition documentation. We have a big collection of Raimund von Klebersberg, a famous geologist, um, later rector of the University of Innsbruck, and he uh, accompanied the uh, Alpenverein expedition in Pamir in 1913. So that's also a different aspect, expedition documentation. And of course, hmm, climate change. Um, so this is uh, uh, the Rhone glacier in Switzerland in uh, around 1930. When you compare this to a picture of now, almost uh, the whole um, glacier is gone. Now the third and last article I want to talk about, Günther has already mentioned it, um, uh, Markus Wurz's article on uh, World War I um, and uh, Austrian uh, private social photo albums. Um, so here you see one of these um, pages that he has um, used. Um, Markus Wurz um, stresses the point of the importance of uh, soldier photography albums, not only individual pictures. And these albums complete the official photography from 1914 to 1918. Uh, Wurzer mainly focuses on two um, uh, photo albums of Bernhard Feitel, uh, who stems from Linz in Upper Austria, but um, was deployed in the Dolomites. So you see some day-to-day uh, um, -day life, um, but as uh, Marcus um, has uh, put uh, out, um, you do not see the mass violence going on at that time. So these photo albums, that's one of his main um, theses, do not show the real reality of war. Um, they are, were also influenced by official guidelines and therefore reproduced normative imagery. Wurzer finds much more information on battles, losses, and cruelty in Feitel's diary. Uh, this is another um, page uh, of the second album. And here you can see the whole collection on the left hand side, the two photo albums that he has used, but there is also the diary. And in this diary, so, so to speak, uh, Marcus was um, uh, able to fill the gaps that are not in the pictures. Thank you. Okay, Martin, thank you very much. So I think through these two presentations, all of you who are present in, in this uh, presentation of CES 30 get a good view of the kind of uh, uh, essays uh, that cover photography, visual history in Austria. One essay that is particularly dear to my heart that I'm so glad we got 
was the essay by Arno Giesinger. Arno Giesinger is a photo historian who lives and works in Paris. But in this case, he has managed, and uh, together with other people, he is preparing a photo exhibit at the Vorarlberg State Museum uh, next year, I think, about a photo archives in Bezau in the Brinzerwald, which is the town next to my town where I grew up. Uh, 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 and it's the Phil Hiller photo studio. And the interesting thing about it is he shows or analyzes pictures from everyday life that I'm very familiar with. Uh, people going through life from birth to death uh, he would go to this Hiller photo studio uh, or ask them to come to their house uh, in order to document their personal life. So that in and of itself is interesting but in the essay he makes a very interesting point i think that concerns us all namely that such photo studios in austria in the united states i think everywhere in the world existed in every community until the 1990s but with the comer, with the coming of uh, uh, the cell phones everybody sort of became his own photo historian and it's true if you think about it how much you document yours and your family's and your friend's life every day with your iPhone because their pictures have become so good. So you don't need a photo studio anymore. But that, of course, then also raises the issue that uh, much of these private photographies will not be stored in any way. So will not be available for future generations to analyze like the Hiller Photo Studio is because uh, uh, they preserved all of their negatives and now use those negatives to put this exhibit together or to write this article for our volume. So I think, you know, you probably could have done a similar essays on photo studios around Austria that went through a similar change up until the 1990s, documenting private life in Alpine and rural Austria and in city Austria and then because of the new technology going out of existence. So I think that is a very interesting uh, uh, aspect to keep in life about photography, past and future. With that being said, I would say we open the floor up to questions. And uh, since it's not that many people on this call, I think you can ask your question online. Anybody has questions or comments about what was said? No questions or comments? Uh, I know we have uh, Anne-Marie Steidl on from Vienna. We have uh, Joe Patruc on from Canada. We have Tim Kirk on from England, I saw. So if anybody, yeah, Anne-Marie, you want to ask a question? OK. Uh, since you named me, so uh, I, I couldn't resist. It's a very practical question to uh, 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 Martin and uh, Johan, uh, both of you, uh, it's about how do you get rights of such pictures to use them, for example, uh, in other publications? Is it hard or, yeah? <clears throat> Good question. Uh, how do you want to start? Sure. Um... Well, when we acquire photographs, then we also uh, ask for uh, all kinds of permissions for use and reuse of photographs from the photographers. In this case, with uh, Okamoto, we, we, we acquired the full rights, uh, so we can do basically everything we want with those photographs. Mm -hmm. um, there are... Uh, uh, Günther mentioned the the cell phones, iPhones, etc. Uh, there are press photographers, photographers or uh, contemporary photographers, professional photographers who really have struggle with their profession and 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 struggle uh, earning money. So some of them. Uh, they want, uh, uh, for example, when we negotiate with them that we share the licenses, the revenues, which in in when we think that this makes sense and that it makes sense that the National Library 
uh, acquires uh, uh, photographs from, let's say, documentary photographers or press photographers. Uh, then in, in certain cases, we do that. Uh, when it comes to historical photographs, there is uh, basically we, 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 we acquire estates with, with, the, with the usage rights. Thank you. Martin? Yeah, um, we, the, the centerpiece, um, of course, is the rights question. So um, uh, of every small or big um, collections um, that we get, um, we have a contract um, that covers the rights. Um, as uh, Hans said, um, it's easy when you have, uh, let's say, a whole collection of one photographer. So you know that he's the only, he or she is the only photographer. And uh, let's assume that he or she is still alive and he, and he or she uh, gives uh, the whole um, uh, uh, collection um, to the archive with all uh, rights for a future use, okay? Um, from our perspective, we have many, many private persons who show up and uh, give us uh, their family albums, yeah? Not as a gift or not as a permanent loan, but for a certain period of time, because they, let's say, they think, um, for, fortunately, that we are trustworthy. And so they give us their family albums telling me, okay, um, you can use um, all the pictures, uh, everything, whatever you want. Okay, so then the questions start because um, it's always the question, who's the photographer of these family pictures? Some might stem from a, an official photo studio, so they only have the right that it's their property, but they do not have the right, let's say, to hand over the use of um, the copyright because this is still with the photographer, you know? So this is, you have to be very careful and you have to look on all the different um, uh, aspects, um, uh, even of course, uh, uh, especially let's say in the last 10, 20 years, um, the rights on one's own picture. So who is on the picture is also a big, big uh, question that you have uh, to be very careful about um, when you use a, a, an old or a recent photograph, of course, in social media and so forth. Um, one last comment, because Günther talked about the the history or the fate of the photo studios. Um, there is a photo studio that existed here in Lienz called Photo Baptist from 1945 up until 2016. And um, the photo studio's owner, he just closed down his business because he wanted to move to the Burgenland to a new life. And he gave um, the whole collection um, with all uh, rights to us, okay? And in the end, um, they just made um, digital photographs. That's long after the ending of the analog era. Yeah. So I also have, let's say, a lot of um, digital photographs and, of course, many, many passport photographs. And so, of course, you have to be very, very careful in general what you do, um, especially with personal um, photographs. Let me just add something here, Anne-Marie because this is something I discussed with Christian yesterday. So we are also having another book series called Studies in Central European History, Culture and Literature. And the next volume in that series is gonna be on Kreisky. It's a dissertation written at Hebrew University in Jerusalem of a young Israeli historian who is now at the diplomatic service. So he is in Chicago right now. But uh, we were looking for a cover photo for this volume, essentially Kreisky's Jewish identity. And uh, we found a, a good photo, and he talks about this in one chapter about Kreisky and Golda Meir, when Golda Meir visited Kreisky in Vienna in the 1970s. And we wanna put this picture on the cover. However, the challenge is that UNO Press looked who has the rights and they can't find who the right, who has the rights. They, they asked the Austrian press agency, they asked an archive in Milwaukee, Wisconsin that has the photo and nobody knows who has the rights. So in this case, what we do is we use the photo because we like it and uh, make somewhere in the volume an addition that we were trying to find who has the rights and whoever has them should contact us and we'll pay them for it, whatever mm. they charge. And, that happened to us once before 
when we wanted, hey, Abram, Abram is the director of the UNO Press, when we wanted to uh, uh, illustrate a cover for contemporary Austrian studies about democracy in Austria, we put a picture on it of the Austrian parliament main uh, a meeting room. And uh, I actually asked Hans for this picture and he said, yeah, this is fine. No problem with the rights. And then we uh, put uh, the cover on our homepage and somebody found this cover and said, you're using one of our photos. So we actually found out that this picture was taken by someone where this agency now has the rights and we didn't ask the agency and then had to pay a, a, a penalty. So, you know, that can happen too. So it's, it's a very basic question, Anne-Marie, that I think all of us who want to illustrate a book are dealing with. Abram, you want to add something to that? I mean, I just, I mean, that story is true. And, you know, even as we do reverse Google image searches, we find nothing for this particular one. But I was just really impressed with the presentation uh, of this archive belonging to the studio photographer, the way y'all have done it is wonderful. I know that that's a real uh, huge amount of work to both absorb and organize. You know, in New Orleans, uh, we have some of the oldest uh, photography studios belonging to African-Americans in the world. Uh, the camera came to, to New Orleans quite early. And so uh, we're mounting an exhibit and a book next year that is along these lines. And just watching the way y'all have done this has given me a lot of instruction and inspiration. So wanted to thank y'all for that. Um, just, you know, and also the different, the sensitivity with which you handle family photography is also admirable. And so I've learned a lot from this conversation. Thank you very much, Abram. I see uh, Joe Thank Petruch, you. our friend up in Edmonton, Canada, wants to uh, ask a question. Joe, the floor is yours. Hey, hi, everybody. Welcome. How are you doing? <laughs> well, greetings from Western Canada, right? Uh, we're out here in the prairie. It's snowing and uh, cold, but I guess that comes with the territory. Um, I'm involved right now in a project or a bunch of different projects dealing with the internment of Austro-Hungarians by the Canadians during the First World War, right? They set up a whole series of, of internment camps around the country and rounded up thousands and thousands of Austro-Hungarians all over the place. And uh, one of the things that we were trying to work on is developing an archive of all the newspaper articles about the internments. And so we've created this website, or I haven't done it, I had nothing to do with it, but this website was created uh, where you can go and click on the different camps to see what articles were written about these different camps. And my question to, I think particularly, uh, probably this one goes to um, uh, Martin Kohlfle, is once you put the stuff up online in all of these kind of nice digital forms, how do you know if it's ever used again, right? What can you gauge, right? Do you have evidence that people are actually looking at this stuff that you put up there? And if so, what is that evidence? Um, again, it's a question we're trying to evaluate the efficacy or the impact of this kind of online presentation, but it's difficult to figure out what metrics to use to evaluate that. So if you could talk a little bit about, it's great that you could put the stuff up, but does anybody ever look at it? And can you gauge whether people look at it? Thank you. Thanks, Joe. Martin? Yeah, um, when uh, we set up the, the Lichtbild platform that I was talking about, these 12,000 pictures, yeah? Um, my, on my backhand and with my IT and, and, and uh, internet company, um, they set up um, uh, a, a, a mail system so whenever uh, somebody um, downloads a file, I get an email. This is anonymous because the only thing in a regular, I know um, the country where it is downloaded from, okay? And um, I also get to know which uh, uh, um, picture out of which collection is downloaded, yeah? So that's why I could say almost daily, really daily, um, people download all sorts of pictures um, and then you can say, aha, this person might be from Lienz or from Bozen because they download two or five or 20, sometimes 50 pictures um, over a time period of two hours or five minutes. Okay, so this might be one you have to find out um, in the correct and, and, and legal way, of course, 
how um, you, you, you get some, some uh, response um, to, to know um, if it is used anyway. Yeah. So from the in the from the Lichtbild platform, um, that's 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 uh, quite easy. Um, a, a different aspect might be when you put um, a picture um, on um, Facebook or Instagram, and what are the reactions um, to this specific um, uh, picture, commentary, um, uh, or is it sent to somebody else, and so forth. Uh, since the Austrian National Library has a huge collection of pictures online, uh, uh, Hans might have to say something too. Yeah, um, well, we don't track uh, individual users, but uh, we have approximately uh, 700,000 photographs online and 1.2 million digital objects, other not only photographs, and of course, our uh, historical newspaper. Uh, archive um, and we track the usage uh, using uh, simple statistical methods like Google Analytics or others. And what I can say is that the most popular portal is our historical newspaper portal um, and second, the photographs. So visual sources, but also uh, uh, historical uh, newspapers uh, covering basically Central and Eastern Europe um, and and Austria are our most uh, popular uh, popular uh, portals in our digital reading room um, and and uh, uh, with very very different uh, usage and kind of users. Uh, researchers, but not only, uh, especially the historical photographs. This, I think, goes in line with what, what, what Martin uh, told. Uh, and also the newspapers are very, very popular among uh, not only researchers, but elder uh, people. Um, and <laughs> uh, stunning, uh, uh, um, in, in, enough in our uh, social media platform, many uh, youngsters are using uh, those uh, uh, photographs that we are allowed to put online because uh, there are uh, completely other right issues uh, when you when you distribute uh, photographs on on social media. We are quite careful uh, and uh, so, but uh, it, it's true that especially visual media and, and, and the papers, the newspapers are very important. Um, and I didn't, I think what we did not mention in our presentation is that uh, visual sources have been, I would say, neglected uh, by professional historians uh, for quite a time. And it, uh, it is, uh, I think we, we, we did honor also Hugo Portis in our, in this, in this volume, he was one of the pioneers uh, mentioning or, or bringing these visual sources, photographs, but also film uh, to the attention of uh, historical research. And, and I think this, uh, is another very important part of this volume that uh, that 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 I think from in nowadays nobody can underestimate the power of uh, of, of visual sources also for historical research. Okay, thank you both. We have two more questions which I'd like to uh, go forward, and then we're going to end this session. So, Mark, and then Christian. Yes, hello everyone. Thank you, Gunther. Um, uh, down the street from Gunther and, and everybody in New Orleans. And also, hello, Hans uh, and Martin. Thank you very much for an excellent presentation and uh, nice to see everybody. So, uh, just kind of following up on some of your comments, Hans, because this is where my question was, was headed. Uh, you know, your presentation got me thinking about as a historian when, when I was trained, it was overwhelmingly to deal with textual sources right mm -hmm. and and so as you said uh you know uh, i think you're making an excellent case for the 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 you know, how crucial uh, visual sources are as well and you also talked about youngsters and what, what i was thinking is you know we're coming 
I think because of technology, there, there's a, a, a generation of, of people who are becoming really, really more familiar communicating through images, even more so than, than texts. And, and so I, my question is thinking about the future of visual history, and maybe I'll, I'll open this to Hans and to Martin. Just if you have thoughts, um, given, given the way uh, digital technology is evolving, you know, where is digital uh, visual history headed? Are, uh, are we going to see, um, uh, you know, images being incorporated much more heavily uh, in, in historical scholarship, or you just said youngsters are, are downloading a lot of these images. So just, and just, just thinking about if it's going to become ever more important uh, as we become more used to, to using digital, dig digital images. Thank you, Mark. Hans, you want to go first and then Martin? Um, yeah, sure. Um, well, first of all, I think there are, there are <laughs> uh, many different, we are, I think we are only at the beginning of record, of, of uh, using uh, visual sources properly in, in, in not only historical research, but also in other fields. Um, first, uh, first of all, uh, maybe only five to 10% of the historical photographs, the analog photographs are digitized. For example, Okamoto, uh, he, when he, in his year, when he was presidential photographer, he took 700,000 photographs at the White House. And only very few of them are digitized and online available. Uh, we have now 20,000 photographs by Yuichi Okamoto, and we have also 20,000 photographs from the United States Information Services. All the, those 40,000 photographs we have digitized, but uh, with, uh, metadata are lacking, and uh, the, the, the amount of these photographs, um, uh, it will not be possible for individuals to analyze this in a way that we were used to. We will have to use other technologies, artificial intelligence, image pattern recognition, um, and uh, it will not only be done by human beings, it will be done by machines. And, and this is even more true for, for the digital photographs, because then we have not thousands, but billions of photographs and nobody can handle this. So we are only at the beginning, I think. Martin? Yeah, I, I fully support um, Hans' uh, comments. Um, I might add that um, when you look on um, analog, on, on, on physical, um, original pictures, there is still very, very much to be found, especially when you look at the regional and the, and the local level. Um, or you have, have uh, one photographer um, like Okamoto, um, who really, really made a hell of a lot of pictures over decades, yeah? Um, and then uh, you have to uh, work, rework, organize um, these pictures. And then you have to select, of course, this is a big question, um, selection. What, what do you do when you have um, so many? Um, then they have to be digitized. Um, and another big, big aspect uh, when you talk about the future of uh, visual history is uh, what about um, all the, the digital photographs that have been uh, produced um, over the last hmm, now 20, 25 years. Um, when you don't get a hold of them, as Günther has mentioned, well, what, what, what is in, in, in two generations happening um, to the historians who want to write the history um, or the, let's say the day-to-day -day history of Austria in the early 21st century. How do they do it? <laughs> and more and more, um, um, as uh, Mark, uh, you, you mentioned, um, the, the generations that grow up now are so much into pictures, into photographs and in, into film, of course. Um, so how, how do, you, do you get a hold of them? Um, I also, as um, Hans said, I also found out that young um, uh, guys uh, are really into old pictures when they have some emotions about them. When you're part of a young fire brigade um, in a local area and you see an old picture of the same fire brigade 100 years ago, or you are just thrilled. And then you love it, and then you like it, and then you feel, and then you feel it, and then you talk to your other colleagues if they are um, 20, 50, or 80 years old. So um, as I said, there's, there's still 
a, a, a lot um, uh, to be done. The mass of um, photographs, um, well, the, 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 maybe the analog um, question will sooner or later end because there are no more analog pictures here or there um, to be found. And then you move into the digital um, era. We'll see. Really, okay. a, lot of, a lot to do. Well, thank you, Martin. Okay, so we have the final question from Christian Stenico. Christian has helped us organize this event and he is a fellow at Center Austria from the University of Innsbruck, but he is also a fellow at the UNO uh, 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 Press. So he works for both institutions here. Christian, what's your question? I'm just gonna come over here so that yeah. we don't have audio feedback if I, if I use my <laughs> microphone. Okay. <laughs> Uh, just a quick question that was all partially answered already by, by Hans Petscher. Uh, thank you both also for, for the great presentations, uh, because my question was to do with, especially once you have these huge archives, how to, to deal with uh, tagging and making this content available and searchable. Uh, so I was wondering if a lot of it is done by hand to sort of provide information and metadata. Uh, and how much is done uh, with AI or machine learning and pattern recognition and things like that. Yeah. Okay, Martin, you want to go first this time? Yeah. So there's a question um, about well, the volume of for, that. For a, small, for a small archive, even for a private user, there are already some um, face recognition systems like uh, Picasa or something something else. Um, uh, there are, we also have put into force some um, new programming um, from our um, Mbox data system, uh, let's say that um, you have a certain um, information set and certain fields, and then um, you create machine-wise um, the main um, information into the scans, yeah? We always talk about, okay, you see it on the website and then you scroll down and you see the photographer and information. But we haven't talked about yet that you, of course uh, you can put the information in the scans, yeah. And so there are also different ways how to do it, also automatically, also machine-wise. Fortunately, not only hand, not only handmade. <laughs> Thank you, Martin. Hans, you want to add to that? Yeah, I would say that uh, advanced technologies like AI and pattern recognition, these are. Uh, we are in an experimental stage here, uh, uh, working with our uh, 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 research department on specific projects. But uh, when it comes to the daily work in the picture archives and in retro digitization of material, then uh, then is this is basically handmade, <laughs> and uh, and also. Uh, let's let me take the example of of Okamoto. There were almost no metadata uh, available uh, in this archive, and I had to do a hell of uh, work uh, to identify some of the early photographer photographs, even and identify the locations. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, in 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 Germany or uh, where he was and 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 so um, this is still uh, handmade research and we will see what the future brings. Thank you and uh, just very quick follow up question: uh, When you add metadata, do you use a, a standard format like TI, the Text Encoding Initiative? Uh, which has things like uh, persistent identifiers for people, for example, which would make it possible to search for individuals or uh, photographers across archives. So is that a, a, a consideration or not, not at this point? Um. Well, when we when we uh, when we create metadata, uh, then we are using our cataloging system in the library, and there we have uh, persistent identifiers for people and norm uh, norm uh, metadata. Uh, but uh, it's it's impossible to do that for for every single photograph. Uh, or, or for even for for uh, series of photographs, so you have to decide whether you want to do a mass digitization and put online as much as possible, or if you want to uh, 
to catalog properly uh, individual photographs, but then this will take you for several thousands of years, I would say. So <laughs> um, we, we, we are trying to do a mixture here, but our, uh, our, our goal is to put as much online as possible and, uh, and, uh, and, and, and uh, giving access to this material for, for our users, uh, even if we don't uh, uh, have the full metadata we would like to have. Thank okay, you. ladies and gentlemen, we're gonna end it here because we said we wanna stay within an hour or so. So I wanna thank uh, all, uh, particularly Hans and uh, Martin for their presentations and everybody else for their questions. Uh, it turned out to be a very interesting uh, discussion. I guess there would be many more issues one could discuss like the costs of digitization and so forth, uh, but uh, we don't have time for that today. I just want to make you all aware of the fact that next Wednesday we have another talk in our Center Austria uh, occasional talk series. Uh, the, the speaker will be Farid Hafez, uh, who is a specialist on Islamophobia. He is currently at Williams College in, in Massachusetts, but he'll give an online talk on Islamophobia in Austria and in Europe next uh, Wednesday at uh, at uh, 12 o'clock again. So if you want our invitation, we'd be happy to send it you because that will include the link as well. That being said, I'd like to thank everybody again. It, it's sort of wonderful, you know, the modern technology that here from New Orleans, we can bring Hans in from the eighth district in Vienna with the wonderful background image of the Prunksal of the National Library. We can bring uh, uh, Martin Kovler in from Lienz in the Eastern Tyrol no boundary, so to speak, the technology works. So thank you very much. And uh, we'll hope to do this again. So Bye. thank you. Thank you. Greetings thank to all in your audience. Thank you for like the great video. So nice to see you all. Bye. Best to everybody. Bye.